Unitarians. Um, 30 years ago, this summer, the um, pastor at Trinity United Methodist downtown called a meeting of all different organizations and churches in town because he was concerned that we didn't have, we weren't taking good care of our youth. And this was when, if you remember back 30 years ago, there used to be lots of kiddos sitting on the steps of Trinity and in the evening. That was sort of the gathering place for young people. And so, and whether they got into a little trouble or not, I think there probably was some that happened. And his, his name, I think, was Reverend Boyer. But um, that was, that meeting was the beginning of the Hicksville Community Service Center. And so for 30 years it's been in existence. It started out, it was in the house at the corner of um, Maine and Smith, Cornelia. Maine and Cornelia, where Battershells lived. And it also was where Battershell um, cabinetry is currently located. It was there for a while. It was downtown behind Bruce's for a while and for the last couple of years it's been right next to the police station through the generosity of the village because that building is owned by the village and so they um, let us use that. Um, the history of the center is that originally it was totally funded by United Way. And so we worked closely with United Way and were sort of the Hicksville supporters of United Way. But in recent years, United Way um, decided that because we did not provide direct services, because we weren't social work kinds of people, they gradually cut our funds until they no longer give us any money. And our purpose has always been from the beginning to enrich the community of Hicksville. And what our mission says is that the Hicksville Community Service Center will be the driving force to enrich, enrich the well-being of our community. We accomplish this by working closely with other local organizations, identifying community needs, and then recruiting, developing, and supporting services to meet those needs. And so that's basically always been our mission. We tried doing direct services because United Way told us they wouldn't give us any money if we didn't, but that's not really what our purpose ever was, and it never really fit. Over the years, we've had great directors. We started out, Janice Meyer was our first director, followed, followed by Barb Donnelly, followed by Shannon, who was director for over eight years. And following Shannon, we've had um, uh, probably four different people that were directors for less than a year. And this was based mainly on two things. First of all, that they really didn't like dealing with United Way, that that wasn't their favorite thing to do, and that was real difficult for them. And they were real concerned about, you know, long-term funding for our organization. So we haven't had a director since last October. And, um, and I'll talk a little more about that later, but one of the key things that we do is that First of all, we provide a home for Northwest Ohio Community Action. So when Community Action comes to town, they meet at our center. And we also serve as the umbrella organization for three different committees or organizations. And I'm gonna ask each one of those to talk a little bit. And by being the umbrella organization, what I mean is that we have a 501c3, so we're a nonprofit organization. And rather than those three organizations, which are small committees or individuals, getting their own 501c3, they work under our umbrella. They're involved in our strategic planning, and um, we support them and also provide the financial 
backup for them and that they each do their own finances, but we do the audits at the end of the year and you know, sort of make sure their books are in order. So the first of those, which um, came about probably 12 years or so, was the Hicksville Beautification Committee. And um, that was a committee that was originally started by Lila Whitting and then involved more people and involved more activities. So they, need, they needed a place where phone calls could be answered and they needed somebody to um, sort of manage their money initially. And I'm going to let Linda Foster, who's a member of that committee, tell you a little about what they do. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Rotary for your support for our committee, for the community. Um, there are lots of things in this town that couldn't be done if it weren't for you fellows and you gals. Um, one of the main things has been the uh, Park Pavilion update. Um, last year, I know you, I stood up here and you think, okay, she's going to ask me for money again. It's not going to happen. Um, the, the redoing of that park area around the pavilion has just made such a difference in our park. And if it weren't for you guys and your support and your getting some other people to help us and whatever, we couldn't have done it, um, but I have had so many compliments and so many comments about how that opened up the pavilion, it opened up the park, it's just, it's absolutely gorgeous, and it's pretty much maintenance free for us, it's, that's a great thing. So, um, I'm going to thank you, thank you so much for your help with that. Um, downtown, we, we finally think we have the, the hanging basket situation under control, they look good so far all summer. It's taken us a couple years and some help with from uh, straight gate to get those so that they endure and last and and uh, but they we're really happy with those this year. Also the hyper tubas we had um, help from greenhouse effect to plant those and so um, they look nice. Um, and I guess what I want to tell you is that without that water wagon, none of this stuff would look like it does. So we appreciate. Um, you're giving us, helping us get this the water wagon and and uh, get it done. We have about, I think, 12 people, 12 people who are keeping this all going. We really need volunteers. So if you have a spouse or you yourself would like to help with any of it, um, we need somebody to help weed a little bit. Um, we need some water wagon riders, drivers, um, and this is all it. You know, whenever. Whenever you can do it. We aren't asking for anybody to really be on the schedule, but we can use people to just step up and, and help. Um, I guess we were talking about money. I think I should tell you that our flower sale this year beat a record. We had over $6,000 that we sold over Mother's Day weekend in flowers, which funds the flowers that we plant in the, in the community. So um, the more we make there, the better the better the flowers look and the more we can put in for that. Um, anything else? We, we, uh, had um, added some new, some new, some more new beds this year. We added another one at the park, at the Waterworks, Waterworks building. Um, I think we're going to use a few perennials instead of annuals some places so that maybe we can do some continuing things that, that look good around the community. Lots of annuals sometimes, you know, they peter out at the end of the summer or whatever. And so a few perennials to keep things spiffy for into the fall season. And um, I think that's about it. I just want to thank you so much for all your help. And um, you can call them and volunteer anytime you want to. Thank you. Next is Steph Carrickson Mazur, and she's going to be talking about Helping Hands of Hicksville. Hello, I'll reiterate what Linda said, and thank you guys all for everything that you do. I often look around and I just feel really blessed to be in the community. 
um, this community in which we live because it is. I mean, it's got a good school system, the parks are beautiful, and the people always seem to rally together to get things done, and it's it's quite quite wonderful. Uh, I do also want to send a special thank you to Shannon who kind of kicked my butt into gear to get this thing started because we actually talked back and forth about doing it. Do you remember this? I was talking about this all the time. And she, she's like, just do it. I'm like, okay. And so Michael and I just did it. And um, thanks for the uh, <clears throat> sharing the, the check with us today um, from the golf outing that was much needed. What we do is we help people who have cancer. Um, the nature of cancer we are all aware of. I have clients that are no longer around, um, unfortunately. Um, but we do guest cards. I will go and clean people's houses if they need to. I will do their lawn work. Uh, we have gigs. So um, I'm sorry I'm really emotional. I don't know what issue is too much cancer, I think they get tired of it. Um, but that's what we do. And we also branched out, we've given uh, funds to people who have other serious illnesses, if they really need money to get to Toledo or Cleveland, we'll give them gas cards also. So it's not just cancer, it's just primarily cancer. Um, and I really don't know what else to say about it. I've talked to you guys before about this, and so it's, it's there, the community center, um, helps us out because it is a 501c3, so all the donations that come in are tax deductible, which is very helpful. And if you have any other questions about it, I guess you, a lot of you know who I am anyway, you can just ask me. It's, it's pretty simple. And I do, once again, appreciate your support. And last but not least, and also newest for us, is the Veterans Memorial Committee. And this started basically just this summer in that when they originally were set up, they were working through the village and the Defiance Area Foundation in terms of fundraising. But um, the mayor and um, the village administrator had contacted me and said, is there a way that they could work through the community service center because by running their money through the village, it just made it a lot more complex. They had to have purchase orders. They, I mean, there just were a lot of things that needed to be done. And so we moved their money into a, an account here in town, but it runs, it uses our 501c3, and we work closely with them. And so today from the committee, um, we have here Roger Zedai, we have Ethan Wilhelm, who's working on his Eagle Scout project and is part of that committee, and our own Larry Haber. And I think Larry is going to say a few words, or more than a few words. <laughs> you all have a pamphlet that's on your plate. Hopefully you'll look it over. That looks somewhat like what we're trying to do. Here's a rough sketch, if anyone wants to see it. The location down at the corner of Arthur and uh, Brian. And so I'll leave it here in case anybody wants to look at it. Uh, we are progressing quite well. Our date to have it completed is next November. Presently, we have roughly 70,000 out of 185 we need to pay for the whole project. So uh, if you have any questions, please. Just starting, and uh, I really wanted to take a part of it. 
Um, but um, now that it's starting to get along, um, Mr. Mr. Rogers Didi came to me um, through our, uh, our through family. Um, we we're very acquainted, um, and he said, "Ethan, I think I have a, an Eagle Scout project for you." And then he he'd helped me look for a few ideas before, and um, but he said, um, "Why don't you come down to the committee meeting and um, we'll see if we can help you." And uh, as I got there, I, I sat down and I uh, I just I wanted to listen more than, I guess, take part the first time, but they got me involved right away. Um, I came I came home from that meeting, and I was just, I guess my words would be, I was just excited, very, very excited. I called, I called Dad right away, and I said, Dad, I have an Eagle Scout project. And he, he, he came home, and he said, I could hear the excitement in your voice over the phone, and I just knew you, you were happy. And uh, I, he was right. I was, I was very blessed to be a part of this project and um, I think it just adds to the character of the town which like Ms. Mazur said we have a lot of it around. We have beautiful facilities, a park, um, the school is great um, and I attend it you know, so I don't want to be there but I have to go. <laughs> um, but um, they got me involved right away and so um, my troop um, if you live in town you, you've probably got a pamphlet um, my troop, we delivered that, all of those 12,000 pamphlets in, in two hours. And uh, it, it wasn't the fastest we've ever done it, but I mean, we did a lot. And um, the troop is they're very excited as well. Um, I told all the boys, if you want to partake in something, I mean, this is something very great to partake in. Uh, I mean, uh, I hope that you, the city, and uh, all of you are very excited to, um, I guess, help support it, and I ask for your support very much. And um, I think that's all I have to say. Um, hopefully, I can gain your support and trust. Um, and thank you, and keep supporting us. Um, well, like Miss Max said, she wants to hear uh, what my part is, and um, like I said, uh, I helped. I was in charge of distributing all the pamphlets. Um, but um, with the memorial, um, my main part is, I guess, just the landscaping, which will be one of the last few things that, um, that will happen um, after we've uh, got the majority of it all said and done. So, thank you again. So we have three really important committees that are part of our center. And our job right now, and, and we have a, a board that's composed of Sandy Brown, Barb Donnelly, Susie Guilford, Cheryl Miller, Steph, Linda McMahon from the Senior Center, and our president, Angie Slattery. And starting probably two or three years ago, we started these discussions of were we still something that should be part of the community? And Larry Coburn helped us with having some community meetings. Again, this year, earlier in the year, we had a couple other community meetings talking because we, when um, Justin Kuhn started his Hicksville Helping Hicksville, we were hoping that some way we could work together. We would have been happy to turn everything over to him. I mean, we just, we, w we didn't think there needed to be multiple organizations and we appreciate what Justin is trying to do but Justin really wasn't interested in what I mean because basically basically what he said and if you know Justin you can appreciate it because what he said was well you guys don't do anything and um, we just do things differently than what how he wants to do it and I still think that there's a way that we can work together is what we tried to say to Hicksville helping Hicksville is that what we have is the organizational structure. What he has is the, um, you know, the youth and the, he has good ideas and he wants to accomplish good things in this community. And so it seemed to me it was a no-brainer that we could figure out a way to work together, but that hasn't happened. So we'll continue to work on that. We also have been talking to the village and um, 
and Diane has been to several of our meetings, Mayor Diane, and we're continuing to work on that as possibly a way that um, working through the village we can develop a position that does more things in the park because in the past we have always done through our community service center the summer park program and because we don't have a director anymore that didn't happen this year and it was done a different way but there's just so many things that could be done here in Hicksville that it just, I mean, it's good to have volunteers and we definitely need, one of the things we've talked about is a good volunteer database, but we also need somebody who's paid and it's not a full-time position that could sort of direct traffic in all the things that we do. So we'll continue to work on this and we continue to talk to other organizations and figure out if we really are viable a viable part of the community. I thought that the um, community meetings we had earlier this year were really good meetings. Lots of good things came out of those. And so one of the things our board talked about was even having like three times a year or four times a year community get-togethers where people from the different organizations came together and talked about how we can work together because we're, we're too big to not work together. So that's that's sort of what we look at our job as being, and um, whether we're around for a longer period, somebody will take over the kinds of things that we do. So thank you very much. Any questions for me or for any of the other people? I think it's real important, and, the, and Rotary is supporting the Veterans Memorial Committee, the Rotary Foundation, our local foundation. So we're thankful for that. And I think with the, the Veterans Memorial Committee, um, they really need support because they're trying to do raise lots of money in a short period of time. And so any way that we can help them as individuals, that would be great. And Ethan talked about the landscaping project, and he's working closely with Ewing Nursery to develop a basic plan and then he will put that plan in place and I'm sure the water wagon as it passes by will be doing the watering in the future. So it ends up everybody works together. Thanks so much. Scholarship was Lindsay Kinner. The endowment were Quentin Graves and Avery Demlin. And then the foundation scholarships were Brandon Green, Emily Hornish, Zachary Betts, Logan Van Dyke, McKenna Weatherhead, and Catherine Murphy. So if you want to come up and say a few words. Coughlin. Um, next year I will be attending Indiana Wesleyan and I will be majoring in piano performance and media design. And once again, thank you for uh, selecting me for this scholarship. Hi, I'm McKenna Weatherhead. My parents are Bob and Shelley Weatherhead. Um, first off, thank you for the scholarship. It's been a lot. Um, I'll be attending Bowling Green State University and I'm undecided right now, but leaning towards healthcare, and I'm minoring in dance. Hi, I'm Kate Murphy. My parents are Bill and Amy Murphy. Um, I am going to be attending Defiance College this fall with a double major in history and nursing. And I'd like to thank the Rotary and anyone else here who has contributed to my graduation and college fund. It has meant so much, and thank you also very, very much. Actually, really cool this year being one of the people who are returning. 
as a scholarship recipient to actually thank you in person this time instead of sending a card, so that's kind of cool. Um, I'm going to be attending University of Finley again in the fall as a junior. My major is pre-veterinary medicine and I have a minor in biology and chemistry. Thank you. Hello, my name is Logan Van Dyke and I graduated from Hicksville High School and so I just want to thank you all for choosing me for the scholarship as well as well with all of these high reputable students here. And I'm going to be going to college in Bowling Green and majoring in visual communication technology. So it's similar to Edith's uh, marketing media kind of thing. So that's my plan. And so thank you for being part of it. I'm going to introduce you both. Yes, He's here, Greg Van Dyke, and my mother is Rhonda Van Dyke. President Galbraith and Rotarians, it's my pleasure to introduce my program today. It's Morgan Bland. She will be graduating from Pixville High School this year, and she is going to talk a little bit about her musical career and playing the violin, which she's been doing for about 10 years now. She's the daughter of Scott and Jody Bland. She has three siblings, and please help me welcome Morgan. seven years old when I started violin. Um, my dad wanted a porch band where everyone in the family was going to play an instrument and we were going to call ourselves Plex. Don't know why, that's what I wanted to know. And he took me to a music store when I was six years old and, you know, I'm going, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to play the drums, I'm going to play the electric guitar and all the cool stuff. And uh, he wasn't having that. <laughs> and so he took me there and he had a person play all the instruments and when they had got to the violin he had them play a song called Orange Blossom Special which I cannot play and um, I, I just knew that was the one I was like this is what I want and there were several other instruments that were played after but I was like no this is cool <laughs> so I stuck with violin when I was seven I finally got lessons for it and I started lessons here in town with Early Harris she taught me for three or four years, and I'm now with my current teacher, um, Marcy Chetakosti. I've been with her for seven years. She's the musical professor at IPFW, and she's a violinist in the Fort Wayne Philharmonic. Um, I also play in a symphony. I play in the Fort Wayne Philharmonic Youth Symphony as a first violinist. My hopes that I'll be co-concert master this year. It'll be pretty cool. Um, but I played in that ever since I was in sixth grade. So, um, got quite a bit of professional experience. Um, but my dreams for it, um, I really don't want to play in an orchestra when I get older. I would like to go to Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'd like to major in musical performance with an emphasis on performance and business. And with that degree, I would be able to go out into the musical field and be a session instrumentalist, which basically means that um, I'll be able to be in a recording studio recording for whoever commissions me to play for them. Um, and I'd like to perform live for people, probably have a band or something. And I'd like to teach little kids. Um, I actually have a couple students now. It's really fun to teach them. Little kids are awesome. <laughs> and I actually, I had the honor of being able to um, help teach the IPFW Strings Camp this past Summer. Um, was it? it was not very long ago. <laughs> I don't know how long ago it was. But um, I got to teach it and I got to work with um, kids who were between ages 8 to 11. So they were the really younger because the camp age ranged all the way from um, 8 to 15. Um, so I got to work with the really little kids, and two girls in particular I was put in charge of, they had like just started by them. The one had only been playing for like <coughs> six weeks or something, and so she didn't even really know her notes yet, and I had to make her understand this orchestral music so that she could play it with everyone else. And the other girl, she'd only been playing for two years, so a lot more experience, but still she's like, <laughs> So I had to work with them on a daily basis to try to hone in on specific parts of the song so that they would be able to play well with the orchestra. 
And actually, I have videos. I didn't bring them. I really should have. I didn't think about that. <laughs> but I was able to get them to um, play with them, and they were doing fairly well. So that was super exciting. Um, it's really difficult to teach, but it is really rewarding to do. Uh, I think what I like best about teaching is you get to continue to use that kind of childhood creativity that people, you know, when they grow up, they're like, oh, you don't need that. You don't you just stop coloring pictures. You don't need to do that kind of stuff. You need to go get a real job, you know. But I've been able to retain that because I need that for what I do. Because, like, I was teaching a trio. And, you know, I thought plan A, B, C, that should be okay. I had to go all the way to plan F to find out what worked for this group. So if I don't have that kind of creativity just right there, it definitely wouldn't have worked out. Um, so you have to have a lot of patience to be able to do it. Um, and the reason I'm not there, I have you notes. Know, so I wasn't really sure what I was going to say. I'm like, I'll be prepared. <laughs> um, so the reason why I play. Um, music to me, personally, is a really spiritual experience. I really, um, I like to worship through my music. So, for me, like when I was going through a rough patch in my life, music was one thing that always spoke to me, whether I felt alone or no matter how I felt. Music was always there for me. And, like, if I couldn't put into words what I was feeling, um, I could put into sound what I was feeling. And something could, you know, play back and resonate with me. And so I play it to connect with others in that level. So, you know, they can know they're not alone. There is something out there for them. It's basically to, like, expose the human emotion and really get down to the core of what we are because music really connects us in a way a lot of other things can't with so many, you know, divisions between everyone in this world. Music is something great, and it brings us all together, and we just realize, oh, we're just human. I'm just me. I'm just a person, you know? So it's really great. I like it. It brings us all down to the same level. Um, I have been blessed with a lot of great experiences, especially in the past year of my music career. Um, I don't know if any of you guys know who the piano guys are, um, but they're kind of big in the classical world because they mix mainstream music and classical music together to get kids excited about classical music so it doesn't you know, die out, per se. And I was able to play with them which is really exciting because I've been obsessed with them since I was in like sixth grade and I've never had to see them in concert, but I got to play with them. I was like, oh, big deal, okay. <laughs> and I actually, I got to lead an entire string section to back up their playing, which was really awesome. It was a great experience. I got to do that at the embassy. I actually got to tour Belmont, the college that I'm wanting to go to, in April. And I was able to work with all these different professors. I had lessons with them. I got hooked up with the producer, you know, a whole bit. You know, first day I was down there, I was like, holy crap, look at this. This is so cool, you know? And um, so then I later went back for the camp. Um, it was it was an expensive camp. I'll get more into the expenses later because like, you wouldn't believe all the behind the scenes stuff that goes on. But it was an expensive camp that, you know, it, like, okay, is this really worth it? But I was, I was blessed with two scholarships. I got a $300 scholarship from SAI in Fort Wayne, and then I got a $225 scholarship, I think, from the Black Swamp Arts Academy. And um, so I was able to attend this camp, and working with these professors was just really amazing, because these are people who are really big players in the field already. Like, um, Billy Contreras, he's the Celtic Country Professor, um, he is George Jones' violinist. Um, let's see, there's a lady there named Tammy. I can't think of her last name. I'm without my hair now. But she's Reba McIntyre's violinist. And then um, I got to work with several people who play in the National Symphony, which is really awesome. And working with them all, it was just a really amazing experience because they were impressed with me. And I was like, wait, I'm on that level? Because I don't really get to be around a whole lot of other musicians all the time. So it's not like there are that many in high school, you know? <laughs> so um, being around people who do what I do is a pretty neat experience, you know? And it definitely solidified my decision in wanting to go there. Um, let's see what else. I have a band. This is a recent thing. It's pretty exciting. 
Um, we play rock and blues music, and we have no singer. I am the lead. So there's really, there's an infinite number of things you can do with the violin, and that's what makes violin in particular so fun. There's, there's so much to learn. You never stop learning. It's awesome. It's so cool. <laughs> um, so behind the scenes stuff. So most people, what they see is the performance you give. The performance you give is really just the culmination of way too long practicing. And they don't see that. They just see, oh, you know, 45 minutes or whatever it is. They're like, yeah, that was good. And you're like, whew, thank goodness. <laughs> because, I mean, on average week, I put in about 20 to 25 hours practicing. Um, but there have been weeks I've put in as much as 50 to 80 hours, depending on what I have to do. And it's insane on the body. You wouldn't believe. Like, people think, you know, athletes are the only ones that, you know, have to go for, like, this kind of physical strain. But, you know, you're just holding this position for 80 hours. That is a lot of work on your back. And um, in practicing, you have to do it very strategically. I have had to learn how to practice. It sounds really weird, but you really have to micromanage your time and be able to like pick everything apart fundamentally for what it is <coughs> you know exactly what to practice so you can maximize the amount of time you play so um so you can maximize what you play for the amount of time you have to play um so doing that has been difficult and it definitely teaches you a lot of discipline because you know, i kind of like get distracted when i practice i'm like oh my phone oh, no this so that I'm like no, <laughs> and it's kind of hard to do sometimes because, I mean, it requires all of your focus to do it. Um, and let's see, okay, so cost of things. Cost is insane. And this is why a lot of kids aren't able to pursue music as much. Either, you know, the parents aren't supportive, they can't afford it, or, you know, for whatever reason. But um, the cost is usually, um, know, it's what usually separates kids who can and can't pursue music. Because um, like to be in the symphony, for example, it's $300, which is pretty crazy. And my lesson, I think for like $45 an hour. And a lot of people just, they can't afford that because I get lessons weekly. Um, so definitely, I would say thank you to my mom and dad for blessing me <laughs> with this opportunity to be able to do it. Um, because honestly, I can't imagine my life without music. I don't know what I would be doing if I didn't have violin. I would have found something, but violin has been really awesome because if I didn't have music, there would be so many people in my life and so many experiences that I wouldn't have had, you know, if I didn't have music. So it's just it's crazy to think about, you know? Um, all of the different things that has taught me. Well, I already mentioned a few things. Um, some things I didn't mention. Um, it has taught me how to deal with many different kinds of personalities and very difficult personalities. And when you're working with a bunch of musicians, everyone's kind of like, oh, I'm an artist, I'm this, I'm that. And they have like all these preconceived notions about themselves. So they think they're up here and you're down here sometimes. And it's like, it's a little irritating. <laughs> and when they think, you know, they know exactly what they want, this, this, this. And, but you're over here, you're kind of just, okay, how do I smooth that over? <laughs> so it's really taught me how to deal with a lot of different kind of personalities. Um, it's taught me how to stay true to myself because, I mean, you wouldn't think a lot of politics go into music, but they really do, and it's really irritating. But um, it's really taught me to not really put so much emphasis on, like, a position I would get so much as the fact that I'm in and that I'm still playing and that I'm having fun and just doing what I love to do. Um, because when you put too much emphasis on like what position you're in, it gets like really cutthroat fast in the music business. Um, and then it has taught me work ethic and I think I said time. So um, I thought it would just be easier to just show you guys instead of talking about it because it's kind of boring. <laughs> so I brought my violin so I can show you guys a couple of different genres that I'm able to play.
musician, and I've been trained classically my entire life, but I've always felt that, you know, it's not really me. I like bluesy stuff, I like rock, I like, you know, good stuff. Um, <laughs> so I had a request from Bruce Guilford. Um, my band and I, we play House of the Rising Sun. We have our own rendition of a lot of different songs, so I'll, I'll play part of that for you.
Is that the violin you picked out when you started playing? When you um, no, okay, so violins, they come in like different sizes because they all depend on like if you're able to do this, and if you are, then it fits you. If you can go too far, it's too small, then it's too big, basically, that's how it works. And I actually got this violin when I was in sixth grade when I was able to fit a full size violin, so I've had it for about six years now, but it's not my original violin. That's What's the name of your band, and where are you performing, and do you need a drummer? <laughs> um, we're called Talkies Chief. Um, we just recently played at the Falling and Defiance Fireworks, but we we just got hired for um, Rib Fest and Flat Rock Festival. Um, sorry, we have a drummer. <laughs> um, yeah, you should guys come out and see us. Um, I think the dates are September 17th and the 24th. Um, for Flat Rock, we'll be playing for a solid four hours, so you basically come anytime between one and five, and it'll be good. <laughs> but, yeah, you guys are all welcome to come. Can you still play radioactive? No, probably.